Ben McCann, welcome to the podcast. Hello, nice to be here. Yeah, thanks for being on. Man, we have some adventures to talk about. Yes, today, we do. Don't we? Yes. Um, so first of all, we're here uh, in we're, we're in Palmetto right now. We I are guess. in Palmetto, the um, workshop. The workshop, hanging out. Um, but we've been kind of down in the, you know, Southwest Florida area, mm-hmm. Sarasota area, um, is where you're based at. And uh, man, we went duck hunting the other day. We did. We did. We did. We did. What an adventure. Uh huh. Um, that's something that we've been doing for a while now down here. And for anybody that's listening, that's something we've done for a, a good bit now. I think like the past four or five years, we've been doing a lot of duck hunting down in mainly Southwest Florida, mainly on the West Coast. We do a little bit of the main lake stuff too, but he got a little taste of West Coast duck hunting. Yeah, the man. Other day. That was a lot of fun. Well, I reached out to you because, you know, we were looking for something to do with hunting or fishing here in Florida. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I found your account because obviously you're always posting cool oh, hunting yeah. and fishing and bass fishing, and all that shit and, uh, spear fishing. And so I, I reached out and I was like, let's see if we can pull something together, you know? And, uh, we talked about fishing for a minute that didn't quite work out. It's not quite mm-hmm. what you're into right now. I, I was like, I don't care. Yeah. Let's go duck hunting then. Yeah. Um, which is great, man. And, uh, I had never been. So the whole thing was a brand new experience to me and to Andrea, but you know, w- we've hunted other things now. So we've got a little, concept of how it all works and uh it was just an entirely different world from anything i've ever hunted before it is duck hunting is versus other kinds of duck uh you know hunting in general duck hunting is a pretty fast pace hunting it wasn't the, the morning we hunted it was a little slow but most mornings in the duck blind are really exciting fast paced um typically a lot of action um and a really fun thing about duck hunting is versus normal hunting you don't have to be super quiet all the time you know if you have birds working obviously you want to kind of keep it on the hush and communicate, you know, just a little bit whisper kind of thing. But, you know, when birds are, you know, absent or you're not seeing a lot of birds, you can just kind of chat it up and have fun. And so duck hunting is, that's probably, in my opinion, one of the most fun, you know, sort of hunting things that you can do, especially down here. You know, a lot of the up north stuff, they put a lot of hours in. They got a lot of cold weather. They got a lot, a lot of gear. They bring a lot, a lot of decoys down here like we did. You know, it's as simple as take a canoe off the top of the car, you know, some decoys, 20, 30 decoys and go out there and set up, you know, maybe 30, 40 minutes and just get the hunting. Nothing crazy intense, super fun to do. Um, and yeah, we've been doing it a long time and kind of blasting birds all over the place, but we have a lot of fun doing it. Yeah. Andrea told me it was uh, like ADHD hunting because it's yes. just very like it is, it is, it's fast paced because you know, you'll be, you'll be sitting there and then in my case, one of you guys would hear something because your, your ears yep. are tuned into that. You'd hear something coming in. You'd know exactly what you were listening to. You'd start making calls for what you were looking for. And then we were all looking around in the fog, just trying to see where they're going to be coming out of. And then, you know, you have seconds to react. I mean, yes. half the time you guys would be shooting before I had even shouldered my shotgun yes. because it's so fast. So it's so cool, you know, duck hunting versus other kinds of hunting too. Typically, if you're going, you know, deer hunting or hog hunting or turkey hunting, you have a specific species in mind. So you typically are always targeting, you know, one sort of a thing or you got something in mind, you know, I'm, I'm targeting a big white tail or, you know, pigs or whatever. You know, duck hunting is super exciting because you're going out there hunting sort of like, I mean, it's a, it's a type of an animal, but there's so many like different types in that species. You know, you got like we were hunting, we shot, I think, five different species. We had um, ringers, we shot mallards, we shot, uh, I want to say, whistlers. We saw, we heard wood ducks. Yeah, oh, we, we didn't heard see wood any, ducks. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we, I mean, you could shoot all sorts of stuff. You could shoot pintails, you could shoot widge and teal, you know, teal and typically model ducks and whistlers and, and wood ducks and stuff like that are pretty common down in, down in Southwest Florida. You know, you get all sorts of other stuff too. You can shoot divers and stuff like that out on the bay. But it's just a, you know, it's a really exciting form of hunting. Like, you know, especially if you're just getting into hunting, you know, if you can hop in the duck blind with somebody, it's so much fun and it's really addicting, you know. Um, it is a little expensive at times, you know, shells and stuff like that, but it's it's a blast and you never know what you're going to get. You know, you can go out one morning chasing, you know, a specific type of duck and end up coming back with three different things that you had never shot before. So super, super fun for us, you know, and you never know what you're going to get. So it always keeps you on your toes kind of thing, you know, so. Yeah. I want to give people like uh kind of the story of how it went down so they can kind of like follow along with us so early ass morning just Mm -hmm. as early as you can get which is the game in hunting is what i was expecting but we were a little farther away so we came out met up with you guys once google took me to the right spot that is and uh just you you threw us in some gators and we hopped into your canoe 
paddled out in the dark, but you knew where you were going. You were, you'd been yep. here before. You knew yep. the spot. You guys all get together and you confer and figure out a spot. And then you start laying out decoys. And I know there's kind of a strategy with how to space those out yep. and kind of put them in, in various uh, alignment. And that's got to be one of the more complicated parts, right? Because I, I've read so much about like all the different ways that you place decoys. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously in all sorts of hunting, you know, strategy is, is, is a big, big part of it, you know, you know, between figuring out where exactly the birds are moving. So their flight paths and how they're using like on that specific lake, like, and especially down here, if you have low flying birds, they'll use tree lines. Sometimes they'll fly tree lines. Um, sometimes it's, it's cover related, you know, it's, it's bushes or whatever, or, uh, just certain areas they like to sit. So let's say you're picking a flight path in between a feeding area and a, a roosting hole. So you're trying to catch them in between, or you're trying to set up on, you know, the X, which is, you know, if you're hunting, if you have a lot of uh, kind of leeway on where you can hunt, you know, public land, it's it's obviously not private land, so you don't own it all, and you can't, you know, sometimes choose exactly where you want to sit. You know, sometimes the birds actually use that against you. They'll go sit on somebody's private land or sit in private ponds or something like that, but you can intersect them. So the strategy strategy part of it is, is a really big deal, you know, figuring out scouting, putting a lot of time in, figuring out where exactly those birds like to fly so you're in a, you know, a good flyway already, and you're kind of, set up to where you have passing shots. You can also use a call, you know, utilize a call like we did and, and try and call some birds in. Um, certain birds are, you know, much more respond. They'll respond a whole lot better to calls, you know, mallards like to mallards and brown ducks in general. So model ducks or mallards will really, really respond to a call if, if you're, you know, handy with it. Um, whistling ducks like we had, you know, you can get them to circle around a couple of times, sometimes even after shooting them because if you're shooting into a big group of birds and they're all disoriented, you know, disoriented and it's foggy like it was, you know, sometimes you're shooting into a group of birds, they hear gunshots, they don't really know where it came from because they can't really tell, you know, in flight sometimes, especially if it's foggy. So all they see is four or five birds fall out of their flock and they're like, what the heck? They just landed and they'll come back around and do a circle and sometimes, you know, it's really fun, you know, sometimes you can get a couple passes out of birds and really work birds, you know, if you're good with the call and you keep it kind of going and keep them entertained sometimes you can get a couple really good passes on them but um yeah yeah well i mean it is all strategy and what was really cool is that i'm getting to watch all of it and i don't even necessarily understand all of it but i i'm trying to pick up little pieces of it um so we were out there and i you know right about at first light honestly it was pretty productive pretty quickly there like pretty soon we were taking a few shots at a few groups that were coming by it actually really slowed down Mm -hmm. mid sort of midday we had a ton of fog rolling you couldn't see i don't know 30 yards it was like pretty intense fog um but it was it was adventurous day for another reason and i was hoping we could talk about it too because we're hunting on public uh owned land on on county land and it was a great spot the thing is when you're hunting on some of that public land that is bordered by neighborhoods like Mm -hmm. this one was you will get individuals who are not exactly pro hunting um, yep. certainly not of the ducks that I think they probably consider their pets, you know, um, and they may have a word or two for you, a choice yes, word or two to yell, do. you know, across the water and even to interrupt kind of what mm-hmm. you're doing. Cause I mean, it, the, one of the first people that yelled at us, and I think there were maybe three or four, um, kind of interrupted right as a group was, was coming in and we might've had an even better shot at them. So yeah. It's a shame that people feel that way and feel the need to do that. Yeah, and sometimes they do it intentionally. You know, like you were saying, interrupt when birds come in. Sometimes they'll do it intentionally when birds are coming in so you don't get the shot. Um, you know, I think specifically even when those whistler ducks came in, they, they said, don't do it, you know, just to try and intentionally right. spook the birds and make some noise. And sometimes they'll play mu- music, all sorts of stuff. Um, but that's just one of the kind of interesting things of hunting public land, and especially down in Florida, the, the way the duck you know, kind of rules are set up down here. You're allowed to duck hunt on any public body of water accessible by a public boat ramp or publicly accessible um, as long as you're not in a preserve and as long as your shot's not falling on private property or I think they call it like dangerous, you know, so as long as you're shooting in a safe direction. Like when the cops came down and they, they talked to us just to make sure we were shooting in safe directions. Yeah. So the, so for <laughs> before we skip that step, we had probably a second group of people who were yelling at you. And man, I was impressed with how calm you were able to deal with uh, with people who are trying to antagonize you, really. They, they want you to be upset. They want you to engage in what they're doing. Um, and I was, I was impressed with the kind of the style, but I imagine that's not the first time you've dealt with that. No, 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 no. It's definitely not the first time. Um, sometimes, you know, the more you hunt an area, kind of, it doesn't get so bad. You know, the first couple times where, like, the first time you hunt closer to homes, they definitely, you know, have some words to throw across the lake at you. But once they kind of get a little more 
you know, in tune to what you're doing there, they kind of lay off a little bit, especially because it, it, you know, there is a law written to where FWC, um, you're actually not allowed to disrupt hunters, you know, in their hunt. So if you do do stuff like that, you can actually, you know, get in trouble for it, get a fine. So, you know, after they end up talking to FWC or sheriff or whatever, they realize it's legal. They realize there's nothing they can do and they realize for them to be legal, they got to keep their mouth shut and just, you know, let it play out because it's legal. So Right. And I mean, it's not like you guys are there every single day in that no. same spot, you know, nope. disturbing. It's, it's going to be uh, on occasion and during the season and, you know, it, but it was interesting, man. And, and people people spend a lot of their time engaging with things that frustrate them, which always blows my mind because when I have something that, that frustrates me, but I am legitimately powerless to, which is exactly what these people are facing, um, the best thing to do is walk away from that, yeah. you know, to not let it continue to fume. So they're, they're sitting over there fuming all morning, upset all morning and doing their best to call the cops. And so they did, they did at some point yep. call uh, law enforcement, which you told them to, you, you invited yeah. them to. And uh, the cops came down and chatted with you kind of across the waterway there. Mm-hmm. And you explained to them the direction we were shooting and that, you know, these folks were kind of fabricating that we were shooting in their direction, certain things yeah. that we were being really careful not to do. Um, and the cops said, okay. And they, they, you know, took off. So it was, but it was an interesting morning. I hadn't, I've only hunted on private land to this point and uh, where you have, and especially with a bow, no one mm-hmm. even knows you're there, you know? Yeah, it's super quiet. But I'm also on private land where I'm allowed to do it. And it's, it, it, you know, it was up in Wisconsin where deer hunting, that's what you do. So um, this was a new experience on, on public land. I think uh, I appreciated going out there with you guys with, with the experience with this because when I'm out on public land facing something similar in the future, I'll, I'll have this experience in my pocket. You know, I'll be like, oh, mm-hmm. I remember all of these things and this is how you can handle this. And it was interesting, man. Yeah. That's one of the things that's really tough for, you know, especially new hunters. I, how you said, it's kind of a nice thing to, you know, have in your pocket that experience because if you haven't been out there a couple of times and let's say I'm a brand new hunter and you got people yelling at you saying it's your property and you don't really know your stuff, that's a really freaky thing to think like, oh my goodness, I might be thrown in handcuffs today. I called an FWC officer and they said I'm legally allowed to hunt here, but oh my goodness, I might get thrown in handcuffs because yeah, right. he's saying it's, you know, whatever. And that's something that, you know, we've just learned over the seasons, you know, just going through it and just doing it the hard way. You know, if you're really scouting and hunting your own stuff that's never really been hunting, you know, hunted before and it's not getting hunting pressure, you deal with a lot of the the hard conversations, you know, before, you know, it's kind of already a paved road for other people. So, you know, it is something that you do have to deal with, but it's also, it's always a learning experience. You're always learning something new. And, and thanks to the fact that we've been, a, you know, been able to be out there so much, we've learned a whole lot. And, um, you know, a lot of that is, is stuff that, you know, we take in our pocket too. So if we're scouting new areas and moving around a state, we have that knowledge and it's really helpful and it's really cool to share with others like you were. You know, yeah, we were able to oh, it was great, man. I mean, it was so funny too. I, I'm trying not to skip some of the hilarious details here, <laughs> like the old man who was yelling at you. And first of all, okay, the thing is, what does it take to yell at a group of people who are holding guns? And I talk a lot about self-defense on this show, um, which is probably a part that, that you're not um, as familiar with about the show, but we do a lot with self-defense, weirdly. And I can't imagine the situation where you would rather this comes up a lot where you would rather be right than be safe. Uh, it's such a wild thing to me to ra- to, to prefer to be right than to be safe. And uh, so this, this old guy yelling at you is like, he's yelling at you, antagonizing you, and he's literally saying, shoot me. Which is just, that phrase yeah. is absolutely crazy to me to say to someone who's holding a gun. He, like, the truth of the world is that he is lucky that we are reasonable people. Mm-hmm. It, it is insane to say that to anybody holding a gun, shoot me. Um, but that's in his mind, he would be happier to be <laughs> like shot dead than, than to just be wrong. You know, um, that's insane to me. That yeah, that's, wild. that is, that is crazy. That is, <laughs> I think probably the first time we've had that happen either. We've had people be like, you know, really yelling at you to get out of there and, oh, yeah. we're going to this and we're going to that and yeah. whatever, but actually shoot me. That's a, that's a bold step. What a man. statement, yeah. man. That's, that's pretty, that's pretty hardcore. I mean. And like you said, especially, you know, we're, we're pretty reasonable people. There's a lot of people that, I mean, if you're intentionally amping them up, you know, they've been, they're running obviously on low sleep. If you're, if you woke up at three or four, you don't know who you're dealing with out there. That's the point of of everything is there's, there's like this rule in self-defense I uh, subscribe to of like, everybody is six seconds from going on a mass shooting. Like everybody is, it just would take the right combination of things to trigger them. So you've got a hunter out there who's not a responsible person who is like, 
picture any circumstance that could easily happen. Mm-hmm. Someone who's like going through a divorce, fucking losing their mind. They've been drinking all night. They're out there. They're, they're breaking a bunch of different rules of hunting, but that happens too. Um, and you're going to yell, shoot me at somebody. Yeah, that's, that's really ballsy. It's ballsy. It's very, very ballsy. It's ballsy. Um, but I'm glad you warned me too. Like you told me, you're like, hey, sometimes we get, you know, in advance, you, you'd let me know that. And I was, I was glad for that because uh, it, was, it was new to me. And I'm not used to that kind of interaction at all. So I was like. Yeah. And it, it, it is a toss up. You know, sometimes it, yeah. it, it's, you know, I, I try to give you a heads up because sometimes it does get really nasty and other times it's super easy. You know, there's times that we've literally had like five different cop cars pull up and you got people all over the place. And then there's other times it's super laid back and you hunt out there, you know, all morning long and you're set up a hundred yards from homes, but you've done it two or three times already. And they mm-hmm. know the deal and you know the deal and you're not shooting that direction and they know it because they're watching you. And so, you know, they might be waiting there with the phone in their hand, but no, nobody gets in any sort of, you know, physical altercation or any sort of verbal anything. And you can just kind of have a good morning to yourself sometimes. Yeah. You just never know. Well, I was, but, I really appreciate that you had your shit together. You know, yeah. that, that, <laughs> Because uh, at the end there, not to jump too far ahead in the story, but at the end, we did get approached by a conservation officer as we were mm-hmm. heading out, and uh, they were checking on everything, all the gear, yep. everything, really you know, running you guys through the process. And uh, you had all your shit together, which yep. meant I had all my shit together. And it was just a matter of, yep, here's my license. Yep, here's the shotgun that you loaned me. And both check out, and you're good to go. Uh, that was great, man. Uh, yeah, that's, that's one of the things that obviously experience comes you know, hand in hand on that, you know. I've been on so many hunts and I, like I was telling you on the, on the paddle back to, to where we ended up getting stopped, um, that, you know, I've done a lot of the duck hunting stuff completely on my own. Like my dad didn't get me into it. So I've had to do all, you know, the research and really figuring out what's legal, what's not between making phone calls or literally in the act, you know, doing it yourself and, and going through it all, which, you know, it's difficult cause you had to, you know, obviously go through all that stuff and get it figured out. But the benefit of that is just so, so valuable, you know, knowing that you've been there, you know, you're not hearing about it from somebody else. You've done it firsthand. And so that's something I I'm actually really grateful for is that I've been able to, you know, I take a lot of pride in that, that I've been able to do all that stuff, you know, and I've done it on my own kind of thing. And I've, I've done a lot of that stuff and I've met a lot of really cool people along the way and learned a lot of things. And so that's just super cool, but that's definitely something experience comes, you know, hand in hand with. Right. So your, your family or your dad didn't, duck hunt but you guys would do other things right? yes so my my family they like i said they obviously got me outdoors they were always you know putting a fishing pole in my hand but that doesn't necessarily mean they they told me how to use it you know but they gave me the opportunity and so um we used to go camping and all sorts of stuff like that we did mountain biking you know all sorts of fun family stuff we'd go play frisbee golf we'd play kickball all sorts of stuff you know i played a lot of sports when i was younger and they got me they always kept us active you know um and that's something I'm really grateful for and I think is awesome. And, you know, they got me out there, you know, between the camping, the hiking, all sorts of stuff like that. My dad, you know, was a big deer hunter. So he, that was kind of one of his things was deer hunting. As he got older, he started doing a lot of deer hunting. He was actually a lot like you when he was younger. I think he didn't really um, do much hunting at all until I think he was in his 20s area, you know, 20 when he met my mom, kind of right in that age. Mm-hmm. Um, he started doing, he started building his own canoes and all sorts of stuff and going out there and fishing a little bit. And, not much, but just, you know, a little bit here and there. And then he got into deer hunting and, you know, getting around the fishing scene, got him into the whole spear fishing thing. And then he got really hooked on that. So he did a lot of spear fishing, free diving, um, and just holding his breath and going down there and doing that stuff. And then the deer hunting stuff. And so he kind of put me around it. And, you know, if you're on outdoor channel and the next show that pops up is duck hunting, <laughs> you know, over time, it's, it kind of, you know, that's how it worked for me is I just yeah. saw that stuff on TV. I'd see it on YouTube, you know, especially when I was getting like 14, 15 in there. And uh, I remember, like, when I was in, like, third and fourth grade, that stuff was like, oh, my God, I want to do that stuff so bad, you know. Um, And then, yeah, just over time, I just got more and more opportunities. And the older you get, you know, the more leeway you have over your own life. So I kind of, you know, chose my path. and You steered right into it. It's such a rewarding thing, though, to especially to to teach yourself all these things. It's been really exciting. I think that there are things that – there are aspects of hunting that I certainly know more about and duck hunting is not one of them that uh, that all that information was brand new to me where like if we had gone out deer hunting i at least could have told you the difference between a yeah. buck and a doe walking across a field you know uh, this is like you guys are are identifying these birds as they're flying in which is crazy to me man and and uh, it, it is it is a totally different kind of experience the, the waterfowl hunting yes know? they all i mean every duck is different they all make different noises you know they all have different 
actual like their wing patterns are different in flight so some look like they're flying super fast and going slow or some you know big small like they have all different sizes different colorations they make different sounds even just their wings flapping overhead like you said way back in the podcast you know you'd hear birds flying sometimes well before you'd even see them especially in fog like that their wings will whistle you know certain ducks are a lot louder depending on how fast they're going and all sorts of stuff and Obviously, ducks make different calls too. So you know, you got mallards, and then the wood ducks were whistling. Kind of, it's like a, it's like a squeaky sound. And then the actual whistling ducks, they have that kind of thing. And then the teal or chatter, chatter, and all sorts of stuff. And then the more you're out there, you know, especially since it's kind of home turf thing. You know, I'm sure if I was thrown up in Canada, I'd be like, oh my goodness, what are all these sounds? But you know, back on the home turf, you know, you kind of know what all it is, and you've been out there, you know, enough to where, you know, we know what it is, and so we've heard it a bunch of times, and it's something that. It just comes with experience. You know, the more you're out there, the more you hear it. But they all are very unique, and they all make different sounds. They all have different flight paths. They all, even when they're grouped up, they'll fly different. You know, brown ducks will sit, you know, really tight in a wad, and they kind of, they, they'll spread apart. They'll part a piece in, like, two, and then they'll come back together. Whistling ducks, they'll, like, to kind of stay in, like, a, not a V formation, but, like, a long, singular kind of a line thing. Teal will bunch up, get real tight. Ringers will kind of string out, sort of, um, and kind of follow each other or ball up. Um, but not super tight like teal wood. Um, wood ducks are typically in a pair, you know, a pair or four or something like that. They make a lot of noise and they whistle. You know, their tail feathers look a little longer than a model duck would. And obviously, you know, if you're looking at a model duck, a model ju- duck just looks bigger in flight, you know, in general. And the, the neck, how they actually fly the necks longer and all sorts of stuff. You know, whistling ducks, they got bigger wings, so it looks like they're all puffy when they're flying through the air. And so, you know, the longer you're out there, you just kind of pick up on those things. And, yeah. I could see getting hooked on it and I could see, but I think I would have to go out a few more times for sure to even know yeah. what was going on. You know, and that's like, that's the downside of my lifestyle is that I'm sure I would get to try all these types of hunting, but each type will take me a lot longer to become proficient at yeah. because like I'm not in one place doing one type for like a whole season. So like mm-hmm. I had basically one day that I could go out and do, yep. do, do the duck hunting here. And so, um, man, what an experience. Um, but that's not I did we did I cover most of the day Andrea? I think that was pretty much most of it. Well, well, before I move on from ducks, we should talk about eating them because uh you guys were super generous uh and gave me the lion's share of the ducks which didn't make any sense to me because of course I didn't shoot but maybe half of them uh, or half of one of them I mean to say. Um the uh it, it was uh it was interesting like the nice thing about duck hunting I think especially, you know, I wasn't sure if I'd be able to come with you guys. It's a, it's a real privilege for someone to bring you along hunting, I think. And, and I feel very grateful to anybody who let, lets me do that. But I did notice that there's a real social aspect to duck hunting in that the more the merrier. Like when a group comes in, we want as many shots to go off as we can because we're going to have this big haul at the end of it. Yep. And frankly, the more people that come, that's six more ducks that you can get that day. Yep. You Her know, first, so. exactly. Yep. So it feels like... Um, it's it's a real benefit to be able to bring people to this, and that, that makes me feel encouraged that like it's a it's a one of those hunting types that is so good for um, mentorship. You know, um, deer hunting is obviously quite a bit different because you're going to go out. It's you don't really do it in groups. That kind of disrupts your quietness. Yep. It's it's a little more difficult, and it is so much work to get one deer that at yep. the end of it, you're not going to be like. Yeah, yeah, the more the merrier come along. You're like, yeah. that's my deer, man. I worked yeah. for a week for that, you know? Blood, sweat, and tears goes into that. Hell yeah, yeah. So that was really kind of fun to see, just that that social aspect of it. And since you guys, I think I think since you guys go out so often, that's probably why you, you gave us a bunch of ducks to, to take home, Yep, which uh, made us very happy. We go out, you know, often, and obviously we'd had some really good hunts right before then too. We talked about, you know, kind of the morning we'd had right before we shot like 24 between the four of us, um, so we fully limited. So we obviously get, you know, kind of our pick of ducks over time, and so if you have a newcomer come along, you know, to send them home with something that tastes not as good as the other ones is kind of in my opinion, kind of lame. So I was like, <laughs> you know, take, take the best stuff and yeah. it, it, it'll get you, you know, kind of hooked more on it too, you know, knowing that you get, you know, actual like valuable meat out of it, you know, not to say that ringers are terrible or whatever. They all don't taste too far off, but you know, the brown ducks and puddle ducks like that in general typically taste a lot better, like the mallards or the whistlers. It's more, more of a sought after duck. Yeah. Um, and you know, like I'd said before, we kind of get our, our hand pick at them, you know, cause we've already shot a bunch. So we got to, you know, fair enough amount of them in our in our our freezer already so we're more than happy to you know share and yeah it was cool man was, so the uh the two so we took two of those mallards whole uh we breasted out 
the other four. Mm -hmm. When I got them home, I actually also took the legs off of two of those four. So we got breasts and legs off of, uh, off of four of them. Is that true? Two of them. Yeah. Probably the whistling ducks. Whistling ducks had that, that bigger thigh to them. Yeah. Yeah. Two of them, the thigh was, there was almost nothing there. I was like, this is not worth yeah. digging in for that. Um, but the mallards were kind of fun. We did those whole, we, we plucked them fully and mm -hmm. broke them down, gutted them out, um, even saved some of the guts because we like eating like organ meat and stuff. We're into that. So we saved like the liver and the heart and even the gizzard, which I'm very excited to try at some point. It's pretty gross when you cut in and it's all that sand yeah. in there. Yeah, it's something else. It was a good stink, you know, on these, uh, on these birds. It was awesome. So we decided for that first night, the thing we wanted to do was really get like the real duck experience. So... Because I don't think either of us had ever had duck, honestly. Especially ever. wild duck. Yeah, especially wild duck. So we decided this is the first night. Let's make it count. So we cut into the, the mallard and we took out those breasts and cooked those breasts up with the skin on them and everything mm -hmm. and uh, made a little like pan, like an orange sauce in the pan, just the way you're supposed to do it. And man, it was pretty fucking good. Yeah, you'd sent me pictures that looked really good. Yeah. I was like, man, and I've, I've eaten a good bit of duck too. And I looked at it goodness like this guy's a chef <laughs> well we do a lot of cooking that's that's fair but yeah i mean it just felt like you know they deserved it they deserve yeah. to be a good like meal because because some of the rest of those breasts i can see like we're gonna want to chop those up and put those in something and mix them up with a bunch of stuff yeah. but this was the way to like really taste the meat and man that was a lot of fun kind of absorb the full experience you know? yeah just to be like yeah we really like we did it right you know what we I mean? did it yeah did right by those ducks and everything and and now the freezer's getting fuller as we've gone on our like hunting journey which is really there cool it started empty now it's uh we've got some squirrels in there we've got some deer meat in there we've got ducks now yeah that's awesome that is awesome that's a good feeling you know yeah. having a full freezer knowing you've been successful that's always a good feeling coming back you know to the truck or coming back to base camp or whatever and knowing that you have, you know, some good stuff with you and all that, that hard work paid off. That's a really good feeling. And like, there's so many skills that we just like skip completely as humans now. Like, like if, uh, you know, everybody goes to like the apocalyptic thing, but just in general, like what could you do if you just had to go out into the world and procure your own food? And most people have no answer to that question. I didn't have an answer to that question even up to a year ago. And now I'm like, actually now there's probably three different animals and those translate to many more types of animals because if you think about it, it's really just, I know how to take apart a bird now. I know how to take apart small game and I know how to take apart large game. That's going to apply to a lot of animals out there. Mm -hmm. And um, you get some sense of how to hunt those things. And like the, the proficiency, the, the feeling that gives you as a person, I don't know if you experience this, but it makes me feel like um, just more in command of like my own life, my own yeah. existence. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, definitely. I, I think that's a really, really cool aspect of hunting, you know you're not relying on someone else for your food source, you know, depending on how much you hunt, you know, if it's like a, a you know, a once, once a year trip kind of thing, you know, if you're a businessman or whatever, it's not so much that, but you know, if you're doing it all the time, you're really, you're, yeah, you're doing it, man. Yeah. Like you're really out there doing it and you're providing. And we do that stuff all the time from, you know, duck hunting, deer hunting, fishing, we shoot hogs, turkeys, all this stuff. So that's definitely something we've experienced over the years. And I'm really proud to kind of, you know, actually have that kind of knowledge in my back pocket. And it's, you know, especially like you were saying, kind of nowadays thing with all the apocalyptic, uh, apocalyptic talk or whatever, um, and all that going on that that's a really, really cool skill to have. Uh, you know, that's something that I feel like the, I remember the talk a while ago in kind of the hunting scene was that it was fading out, you know, the more, you know, populations going up and there's less land and all sorts of stuff like that, that it's, it's kind of shrinking, especially with, you know, how tight social media is on stuff like that now and how they, kind of shield that from from the average eye you know the average joe that that was kind of i feel like going on the hush you know hunting was kind of fading away and you know it's kind of you know stuff like duck hunting especially i feel like brings that back you know like you were saying how you can have a bunch of people out there in the blind and it's just a super cool experience you know it's a fun way to hunt and it's it's a really good way to get people hooked in you know on hunting and, and get people started just because it is really fun you can chat it up you don't have to be super quiet it's much more of like a laid back hunting yeah um you know, obviously you do have to put your work in, you know, and, and find birds and stuff like that to be successful because no one wants to go out here and drive an hour or so and sit there with their twin of their thumbs for two hours yeah. and then drive back to the car empty handed. That kind of sucks. But, you know, once you're out there, you can enjoy it, man. You know, you know, it, when you're out there that early, you, you get a beautiful sunrise. You know, if you're out super, super early, you get to watch the stars, you know, you see a shooting star go by or two. You can hear all the ducks chattering when you get out there and it's super calming, especially before you take, you know, the first shot and you have people right. yelling at you. But it's just a super cool setting. And, you know, if you've 
haven't haven't kind of you know been able to be around that stuff it's super cool and i think that is a is a great way to get people hooked on hunting i would say duck hunting is probably one of the the most hun, uh fun actually hunting activities you can do yeah. in my opinion i haven't experienced the type of hunting that like i'm not kind of hooked on like they've all been so fun for their own reasons at this point like the deer hunting is really like intense and frustrating it takes a lot a lot of time but there's something really rewarding to all that time and mm-hmm. some of the like just the encounters you have out with that nature and watching the deer go by even if they're out of range is really kind of beautiful and um the the duck was really like exciting and, and just it's fast paced and there's something to enjoying all these actually i think small game hunting has been one of my favorites like i'm really looking forward to doing some squirrel and rabbit hunting in the uh late winter here we're, we're going to go to texas and do some of that because again it's just like duck and that it's it's pretty social you can pretty much walk around and just you know take some squirrels out of trees it's yep. really an interesting one and the meat tastes good and you know you again you know you're providing like something for yourself that's that's such a unique experience and i you know who knows what will happen with hunting but i think it would be a real shame if it did if it did fade from kind of public consciousness i mean in the last year we've had at least i can think of at least two events that made like the food supply kind of a scary thing made people question the food supply the idea that like if the trucks stop running most cities have they say what most cities have three days of food or something like that that's as far as you'll get i mean especially when you see like the hurricane stuff down here yeah it that really gives you an idea of how quick that's true too you know especially if there's a gas shortage you watch Mm -hmm. how quick the gas stations line up with people and they drain it you know yeah or a hurricane comes through and people go to all the supermarkets they take all the water all the food all the everything it's gone like that so i mean and covid was one of those ones too when that first hit but uh, it's been a while since that now but the big storm down in texas uh, the huge winter storm that hit like we were near enough to that that we were experiencing parts of that and and you know shelves are empty and the power's yep. off for days on end yep. and it's it, it's not like the reason i want to get into hunting but it certainly makes me feel better as i learn more and more yeah i'm like i could take care of myself for a couple of days if i had to mm-hmm. no problems um it's a strange it's a strange thing but we do really rely on all these systems to like continue functioning <laughs> and we don't even think about how much we, re- yeah. we just absolutely rely on them. I feel like there's a whole lot of people that don't really see what all goes on behind the scenes either. Like there's a whole lot of people that I probably would assume just think food just pops up on the shelf, you know, and they don't yeah. really see, you know, what all goes into it behind it, you know. And there's, like you were saying, there's a whole lot of people that literally have no clue what to do if, if food were to go, you know, kind of out and, you know, not really pop up on the shelf. There's well, a whole lot of people that would be. They'd be in trouble. High and dry, yeah. Well, it's not even just that to me. Like there's a huge bit of hypocrisy here um that like those folks who yelled at us for duck hunting the thing is like we worked very hard to secure that meat all of us were out there working hard um we took that home all that meat was used and was used well and was appreciated Mm -hmm. um all of that meat lived a wild life nothing you know it wasn't factory farmed but um all those folks who were yelling at us because they're upset about this one thing don't recognize that that night they're gonna go get themselves a burger from McDonald's and that's what they'll be eating. But somehow because they didn't kill that themselves, they can feel better about it. Even though you know that that animal is from a factory farm, it's got a terrible life. It's being fed absolute crap. um, And that's just okay with them for dinner. I think a lot of that is mainly media push stuff too. Cause I mean, if you just had, you know, people out there naturally, you know, if you cut all the stores off and all that sort of stuff and people couldn't get their stuff or their, you know, their basic needs, everybody would be hunting. And yeah. all of a sudden, everybody would be a fan of the hunter on the block and enjoy, you know, that someone here can bring us food. Right. Um, and so I feel like that's just, that's obviously kind of a, a first world problem um, that no one, I don't think, really realizes how valuable skills like that are. Um, I mean, obviously, there are people out, out there that do understand that, but there's obviously a lot of people that don't. It's not even just the skills either, too, because yeah. it's also the access. Like yep. the fact that the U.S. has so much public land for hunting and and you're allowed to hunt in all 50 states and there's certain things like where you go to other countries and there is it is not function mm-hmm. that way. And there's there's mostly private land and no public land. There's very little hunting done um, or in places where no one is allowed to hunt, like uh, places like North Korea. Like when I hear those stories out of that country, it blows my mind. But people are living on you know, plants and insects and that's all they've got. And it's just destroying them. You know, uh, that, that would be someone who would not have that same opinion of hunting. Uh, yeah. It's like we, I think we all see the 
earth as a, like a really bountiful thing around us. And, and that is the first world problem is that we know we live in the garden of Eden, you know, or maybe the problem is that we don't know it, but animals are a part of that. The fact that we have this public land and we take care of these animals and we make sure the populations are good. And it, it's good to harvest them. Um, yeah. But it, it, it is a strange thing that people can't put that whole puzzle together. You yeah. know, I would even argue that there, there are places where it's encouraged or you should be harvesting lots of animals. You know, if you think about like up in Illinois or really up north where the deer populations spike, you know, if they don't keep that stuff kind of under control, they get diseases, they get all sorts of stuff that they overrun and then they're all in the cities and they're in people's backyards and all in the suburban homes and they're eating off people's bushes and they're all over the place and you get more car accidents and all sorts of, you know, I'd, I'd say there's actually all sorts of circumstances where it would actually be really helpful to have some hunting in the mix or a lot more hunting in the mix to kind of keep things under control, you know, because you got to think, you know, down here, there's so much expansion, you know, so many people building and Florida, you know, is, it's got a lot of land, I would say still versus some other places, a lot of swamp stuff and like that, that really open, you know, cow pasture land once you get out too. So instead of, you know, like you think in a city, people will build up. Well, you know, in Florida, they're building out. They're just, you know, if you look at, they, everybody wants a big lot. Why would you not want to have a big lot? Especially right. if the neighborhood can, you know, buy a bunch of land and, and set up a whole subdivision on something new. Why would they not give everybody a nice chunk of land? So they're just like, you know, I what I do for work is I'm always out there in, you know, new neighborhoods and stuff like that installing it. I really get a firsthand look at how much land is just getting like mowed over and just yeah. replaced with like non you know, actual wildlife habitat stuff. Like it's all just being chucked in with, with homes or even in preserves. They'll, they'll put a preserve up and then they'll trap all the animals out of it because they have issues with all the houses around the preserve having animals on it. So very, very interesting. I'm, that's, that's one of the things that kind of worries me because, you know, around here, you know, you're going to have more and more animals kind of push into, you know, we have coyotes. I've seen coyotes downtown, like literally really? downtown. Yeah, and that's, that's something that goes on, I'm pretty sure, all over the country too. Yeah. That's something that's more of a recent problem too. Yeah, it's, uh, well, you know, what's, it's been a cool year for me to have so many like guests like yourself who I've been talking to about all these things. And man, the more you learn about this, it is very hard to ignore uh, some of these facts. The, the thing is that people, I think, have a hard time accepting unpleasant facts, you know, and, and it is not a pleasant fact to have to kill anything. And, and it's not like that's the part that we're all, we all feel great about. We, we want to do it in a fast way. We want to do it in the best yeah. way. You guys run out and try to get those birds. You're working very hard to make sure we recover all of them. Um, and any that are still sort of suffering out there, you make sure we end them real quick. Yeah. It, it's a really important part for all of us, you know. Yep. But it's also just a necessary part of, like, recognizing our own existence and being okay with our own existence. Yeah. And it's always been that way. Yeah, I mean, that's a natural thing in nature. Predator and prey, I mean, for any animal to go on about its life, killing is a part of it. You know, it sounds so harsh, you know, the death of something, but you know, when you look at it, a duck or, you know, any sort of a small game animal to a, to a coyote or a bear or whatever, that's just its life. You know, that's its food source. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what it needs. And, you know, humans aren't any different. You know, they can have, obviously they can eat vegetables and stuff like that. We're, uh, what's that omnivore where you can eat, uh, both plants and, and meat. So we have a little bit more of a broad spectrum and there are, you know, obviously different ways you could approach it. But I mean, hunting is, I feel like that's a deep rooted thing, especially in, you know, actual human you know nature we just do that stuff you know as is where i feel like we're a really apex predator and i think that's something we're put on earth and designed to do mm -hmm. i think there are limits to it you know and that's why they have regulations and all sorts of you know stuff like that and you obviously do have to have some regulation to it it's not like we should go decimate the planet but hunting is not bad at all i think that's a really really useful thing and i think there's so many good things that come come from it and all sorts of really you know like realizing things that that'll that'll teach you stuff that you can kind of apply to other things in life yeah I think well super cool. we focus a lot like individuals focus on the idea of like uh like their carbon footprint which i don't think is a bad thing we can be focused on carbon footprint as individuals and how can we do better on that but what about like a wildlife footprint is sort of what this sparks in me like like there is no such thing as a free lunch um when it comes to existing as a human being even so you can uh as soon as you live in a house or a building, you have to take into account all of the land that you've t sort of taken away from wildlife. Um, when you plant grass in your yard, you're, again, taking away more uh, habitable places for wildlife. If you, even if you want to eat a full vegan diet, a lot of people think that's free from death, and that's not the case at all because a lot of small game dies when you are 
uh, harvesting any field of anything that goes into a vegan diet. So um, like mass agriculture still kills a lot of small animals. Oh, yeah. So th there isn't a free lunch. So no. um, it's almost like I just, the thing that I feel is like, I'm gonna accept that hard fact and then I'm gonna engage with it, you know? And I wanna do the best thing I can do, which I think is hunting um, in order to engage with it and to get those animals and respect the hell out of them and go after them and eat them and, you know, love the process. Like it is so much harder to get rid of wild game meat that's uh, in the freezer or let something spoil that's wild game meat. And I, I've never done it. And I don't anticipate that I ever will, but I've certainly let, you know, in the past, like other forms of meat go bad in my fridge. You buy some chicken breast at the store. You don't, yeah. you have no connection to that chicken. And a week later, you're like, ah, this kind of stinks, and you end up throwing it out. But because you have no connection, you feel no guilt about it. Um, and that's exactly what, you know, all those people that are yelling at us, that's what they're doing. You know, yep. They don't have that connection. Yep. I feel like a lot of people are blinded by the media kind of thing, like I said earlier. I mean, and there's a whole lot of people that I just don't really think, realize what all goes into it. I mean, a lot of those people didn't see you paddle out there at 5 in the morning, and they didn't see you make the big long drive, and they haven't seen all the scouting hours you put in, and they haven't seen – how much really effort you put into it and so they don't respect it you know and they're you know hearing stuff by the media that that's bad and you know they should not do things like that and there's so many other alternatives and all sorts of stuff or you know you got to think if everybody's going out there and collecting you know their own meat on their own how many you know big 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 like food businesses would go out of business you know there, there's a whole lot of companies that are making a whole lot of money off people buying their food and people buying their meat you know no matter how they're you know, going about processing it or, or getting their hands on it, you know, there's a whole lot of, you know, commercials on Super Bowl about, you know, meat or this or that or, you know, mm -hmm. all different food products. I mean, that's a huge part of human existence is obviously food. So, you know, there's so much money wrapped up in it too that media is going to push it. Hey, buy our stuff. Hey, this, right. that. But, you know, kind of keep that on the hush for people and kind of well, steer them away from that. It's more beneficial for like a large society or a large economy for people to be efficient, not self-sufficient. So, it harm it's better for the society but it harms the individual yep. because the entire concept is is it's a basic economic concept which is that everybody should do just the thing that they are best at doing um so that's where like import and export comes in so if this country's better at producing this then they should produce more of that and we should produce more of this thing that we're better at and then we will trade that's that's always been an economic concept and so people do that with their whole lives so you wake up and someone else has made a faster breakfast sandwich than you could make with your morning. And so you're going to put that in the microwave instead. And that makes you more efficient so that you can just zip off, get to work and, and sit, you know, at your computer all day or do whatever you do all day. Mm -hmm. And then again, you're going to come back. Someone else has taken care of dinner because they're faster and more efficient than you are. But the individual suffers in that scenario. I, I like, I don't, it's difficult for me because I'm a really ambitious person. So I like being efficient too. But some of the best things that I do are the slowest shit. Like making sourdough bread is slow. I don't have to do it. I can afford bread. Um, but it's rewarding because it's far healthier for me to eat. Um, and the same would go for hunting, which is I don't have to. I can afford to pick up as many pounds of meat. I can even buy good meat from great farms that take care of their animals. That's fine. And I do a lot of that. But again, it's still better for the individual to engage with the whole process and recognize like their own existence and man, we're here once, and I don't think that the point is to be as efficient to the kind of larger machine as we can be. I think it's to be as efficient to yourself as possible, to pick the things that are good to go slow on and to pick the things that are good to go fast on. And everybody's kind of got to find their own balance, you know? Agreed. Something like that. Agreed. And then obviously if you're, you know, making the sourdough bread or going out and, and getting the animal, you know, you know what's going into it. You know, you know, if you're making the bread, you know, all your ingredients you're putting in, you know, you're not trusting someone else with your health. You know, you're taking care of, you know, all that on your own and you're doing it all the right way and, and the hard way, you know, in most cases, but the good way, you know, yeah. how it should be done, I think. So you pick up a packet of bread from the store and you look at the ingredient list and you yeah. go, I've made this. It takes three ingredients. <laughs> like what is the rest of this yes. doing in here? Um, you don't need it. Um, but I feel like, uh, I feel like I get the sense that you are also kind of have that same uh, sense of drive and like you're a real go getter. You, you get this idea of like kind of living really intentionally and that like there's something about being around you, the speed that you operate at is absolutely insane. Like we would, you know, shoot down a duck and you're like, I'm going to go get it. And you would go jump in your fucking canoe and just like run after that bird. Um, I fully anticipated 
even tonight, like I brought some whiskey and I was like, hey, do you know, do you want some? And you're like, no, it's surprising I don't drink. And I'm like, no, no, I'm not at all surprised by that. Like, you're, I'm actually kind of amazed that you're still sitting here having a long form conversation with me because you're like the speed demon, dude. Yeah. Like, where does that, is that just always how you've been? That's kind of always been my thing. I have a really, really strong drive, you know, like I, there's a lot of things I didn't apply myself in, like school. You know, I was not a big school person, so I wouldn't really, I'd be at school all day and I wouldn't apply myself at all at school. But it wasn't like I was spending my time just totally dead in the head, just sitting there staring at a wall. Mm -hmm. I was spending all my time focusing on something else. You know, half the time it was just me in my own head thinking about what I'm going to do after school when I go hunt and forming a game plan or whatever. But the second I get out of those walls of school, you know, I'd go chase exactly what I wanted to do and I'd have a whole game plan and I'd do that all the time, you know. Or the second I get out of school, I'd already have my stuff in in the car because I'd packed, you know, the day before to go (laughs) scout up at places, you know, like that or go south or, you know, go bass fish and, you know, I think that's super cool about the outdoor world is there's so many different hobbies you can pick up doing that stuff between, you know, the fishing, spearfishing, duck hunting, deer hunting, you know, like you do, archery. Archery, just learning all the aspects of archery. That's between, you know, the form of your shot. And, you know, you can even just learn stuff about maintenance stuff. So like refletching an arrow or learning and and playing around with broadheads and learning what broadheads you like most and learning all the stuff between fixed or mechanical broadheads or learning, you know, how to hold the bow and where your anchor points are and all sorts of stuff like that. That's a whole different realm. You got that. And then spear fishing, you know, you can do, you know, all the little fine minute stuff about that, about what exact tension, you know, you want your band set at and, you know, putting enough hours in, in the water to get your actual body conditioned to hold your breath long enough to go down there and swim a hundred feet down and go shoot fish, you know, and, you know, duck hunting, getting proficient enough to use a duck call and then learning all the differences and how to tune your duck call when you drop it in the mud and you're out there in, in the water trying to fix it in the morning, you got duck, you know, ducks coming in or how to take apart a shotgun or all sorts of stuff like that. How to, pro, you know, proficiently stalk a, a deer, you know, if you're stalking deer or stalking hogs or turkey or whatever, there's so many different things to learn and so many, so many different like avenues you can take in that, in that field. It's just, it's never ending. And, you know, for if you have a really go-getter personality, there's so much you can pursue. It's not like, you know, sports, if you're in the gym, that was one thing for me is like, I'm going to the gym. I got a very specific timeline and I can only achieve so much while I'm there. And then when I go home, you, you know, you can work out, but, or you can shoot hoops at home, but you know, you're, it's almost like you're stuck in a really structured thing. You know, if you're chasing an animal, you got to understand there's no, it's not, it doesn't go to a court in the morning and you go meet it. You got to go find it wherever it's at and you can never do enough, you know, like an animal, you can, you can think you have it all figured out. Your basketball is not going to run away from you. You can, you can go, you know, think you have it all figured out or, or have put all the hours in and all the practice in to go, you know, shoot some ducks somewhere and then get there in the morning and they all moved, you know, or, or be scouting it the night before you go check it out just one last time. And you go up there and you look and everything's gone. And you're like, oh my gosh, we have to formulate a whole new game plan. And you're, it's never enough. You know, you, you could have, you could have put more scouting hours in you and, and then you go to your backup stuff and all sorts of stuff. And that's just kind of like a personality I've always had, you know, my mom's a lot like that. So I think I kind of got a, a piece of piece of that from her, but I am really, you know, kind of like avid outdoorsman kind of stuff. Like when I get hooked on something, I'm all in, like, I'm not, I'm not half he's on half seas on anything. I'm either going to do it or I'm not. So like, you know, the school stuff, if I'm going to do it, you know, I'm either going to do it or I'm not. So school stuff wasn't my thing. I didn't really put any time to it at all, but the outdoor stuff, I threw everything I had at it, you know, like you can't do enough, you know? And that was one thing, like I did tournament bass fishing and stuff like that. And that's another thing that's just, there's so many aspects to stuff like that and learning, you know, all that stuff and working your way up, you know, sort of the, the chain of command and that, and just kind of, you know, building a name for yourself around other anglers and stuff like that too. But, you know, it's just very interesting. You know, there's, there's so much you can actually do. And then there's so much drive it takes, you know, one of the things I had always thought about in that is, is like the drive thing is you could, you could literally, I mean, especially if you're on the coast and all the lakes are way inland, you could spend every single weekend on that lake, you know, and then the kid that lives there can fish there, you know, seven days a week and still fish you. So you're never able to, 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 you know, just do it all. You know, you're always, you're always chasing, you're always pursuing, and there's always something else you could be doing, you know, and, and, furthering yourself so it always keeps you on your toes and keeps you moving and keeps you chasing the next best thing or you know pushes you deeper 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 into that sort of addiction of the the hunting stuff or the fishing stuff or the whatever it's just super exciting and that's just kind of for a personality like mine it it really keeps you on the move and it suits me really well I think that's sort of a thing it's just I like doing it It's, it's a lot of excitement and you know especially when 
you know, media and stuff like that comes around, you can always talk to, you know, people through social media. And like I met you guys, go meet other people and keep it fun. And you can always invite people in the duck blind. Like, I, you know, when you asked, you know, I was like, well, we always got room in the duck blind. You know, I don't, I don't ever mind bringing, you know, new people out. I've brought up a pile of people out. And it's, I think that's super fun to do. You know, obviously it's super exciting. You know, if it's your first time out there too, you know, it's really exciting for them too. So it's fun for me, fun for them. It's just a really great, great hobby to have. And super cool. Yeah, man. I love what you, that tangent you just went on was fantastic because you just summed it up. I mean, you, clearly you have like, you're hooked on these minute details and it is, it is like exciting to you the fact that it's an ocean the fact that you could never know it all but the more time you spend doing it the better you can become at it and there's absolutely no limit to that just the more hours you put in the the better you will become and there's probably no end to it it's the same thing that i feel about hunting certainly it's the same thing i feel about things like jujitsu and martial arts which is like this is an endless ocean but the but the only thing i control is whether or not i show up today to become better or better at this thing so um that, that hooks you and that just mm-hmm. gets you going, man. That gets you ramped up. Yep. And the thing about wildlife is too, you know, like let's say you're chasing deer, for example, you know, a buck, you got to think of how many bucks and it's, when it's an organism, it's a whole lot different. You know, if you're thinking about like a, a sport or something like that, there's a specific trophy or something you're chasing, like the trophy of basketball is winning something or winning MVP, but that's always the same. You got to think an organism is totally different. So like the trophy buck you might think you're chasing him, but it could be a totally different deer, mm-hmm. you know, or even let's say you shoot the buck of a lifetime. Well, there's going to be another one in five years or another yeah. one in two years or another one that grew next year that was a little bit younger than him. So it always keeps you moving, always keeps you chasing the next best thing. And, and ducks too, you know, they ban ducks and stuff like that. And then that's a super cool thing to chase is, you know, trying to shoot your first banded duck. So all that stuff is just super, super cool. And it's like a never ending cycle. Like you were saying, you know, you can just never, you can never do it all. Yeah. You never can, you know, especially if you've got multiple hobbies to try and keep on top of the spear fishing stuff and then be ready when the duck hunting stuff rolls around. It, it's just so difficult to do it all at once, but it's so, so rewarding. It's so, so fun to, to, to pursue all those things at once. And it keeps life super, super exciting. And I think that's, that's one of the things that I would say gives me the most purpose in my life is, is doing that stuff. I think it's, it's always been something I've, I've loved. Even before I actually was able to, to go do that stuff, I'd see it on TV or I'd watch other people do it, other people talk about it at school or whatever. And that stuff was just always super, super exciting to me. And then when I kind of got you know, free reigns to go do whatever I wanted, I, I just threw all I had at it. And it was for a very long time, you know, that was like all I would do. I'd get off school and five days a week, I'd be doing that. And then on the weekends, I'd be gone for two full days. Yeah. You know, that was all I'd, all I'd do. And, I love it. I still do it all the yeah. time. You know, work makes it a little difficult. You know, the older you get, you get more responsibility and stuff like that. So it's not like I get to, you know, just have my parents, you know, paying for every little thing now and whatever. And it's not like they're buying my duck loads now and all sorts of stuff like that. And so, you know, and I am fortunate. There are, there are a lot of things that they still take care of me on. You know, I'm only 21, say only, but, um, you know, there are still things that they do take care of. But then there's also a lot of stuff that is shifting, you know, as a young adult shifting onto you responsibility wise and it's it's a little bit of a learning experience too but i mean everything is you know so exciting a little challenging at the same time but you know super fun and it's always been entertaining for me and i think it always will be i i I don't really know what i'd do if i wasn't fishing or hunting or whatever it's just me you know it's just what i do so well you're making kind of a quite of a name for yourself uh in the world of uh of bass fishing and spear fishing and uh duck hunting and do you like that part of it, like having to produce uh, some media to kind of grow an online presence or anything like that? Yes. Or does that I, part bother you? No, I, re- I really do enjoy doing that, um, you know, especially if you're watching, you know, like Bassmasters or stuff like that. When I was a kid, I'd watch obviously all sorts of shows. And so, like, you're hearing me talk a lot about shows and TV shows and whatever. And it's because when you're a kid, that's all you can really look up to. Like I'd said, right. my, my dad wasn't, you know, the biggest, you know, he, my dad never really had, we, my, I'd never been on a bass lake, like a big public lake until I think I was, uh, like 15 or 16 and then I like from then on I would start doing tournaments and stuff and so my dad hadn't either so you know it's not like I was shown all that by my dad so like the only way for me to really get into that stuff and really learn a lot about that or get hooked on it was from watching other people do it on tv so that's why you know I talk about that stuff a lot is just because that was all I was really able to see to get kind of hooked on it and just watch that and be like oh my goodness it's so amazing well and what a standard that sets too because the people who are 
good enough to make it on TV, we're already talking about some top 1% stuff yeah, here. That's real deal. You like, know, high skilled stuff. Yeah. And it's not, it's even different now because someone like me who doesn't have experience in this, I can produce, you know, short documentaries with, with Andrea about the things we go do. I don't have to be that good at them. No. Uh, I have to be good at telling stories certainly, but it, TV even sort of used to be that extra level of like, if you were going to get on TV, you had to be really good at your shit too. There's, yeah. There was no storytelling for the amateur on TV. Yep. I, de I definitely do enjoy the media aspect too because it's obviously, I mean, she was taking a bunch, Andrew was taking a bunch of pictures out there in the blind and I think doing that stuff is super fun too. I try not to do it too much. You know, you don't, the very last thing you want to do is turn it all into a media thing where yeah. you're out there, I'm enjoying the outdoors, but then it turns into all you're doing is messing around with your phone and your camera the whole time. You right. know, just, you should actually enjoy the moment. And so I do a lot of, a lot of both. I try and take pictures, you know, whenever, you know, I put the boat on the trailer at the end of the day or, you know, when you make a big fish catch and something you want to remember you take a picture but a lot of the downtime and a lot of the really hard scouting hours i i try and just you know be there and you're obviously much more productive if you try and stay off your phone and that's something at work i'll be honest i suck at staying off my phone at work <laughs> and stuff like that you know so it's not like i don't don't go on my phone and i'm saying oh i don't use my phone i'm so old school you know this that whatever i don't like technology you know but <laughs> you, you definitely are much more productive if you limit yourself on that sort of thing and you just you know kind of immerse yourself in the activity itself versus you know just capturing it all i love both aspects though you know i love um like when we do bass tournaments and stuff like that i love getting on stage and, and being able to talk about your day and and just you know sharing with other people you know what's going on that they don't see right and, you know it, that's another thing that'll get other people hooked like Hey guys, well, we were out here today on the water and we caught, you know, a six pounder, a seven pounder and this, that, and a speed worm. And, you know, the person at the, 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 uh, the little kid at the ramp now learns, you know, what you were doing or hears a little bit about it. And that's what I was doing when I was a kid, you know, that's what was fueling me. And now he's getting the same fire. So I think that's super cool. And I've always loved the media stuff too. And plus, you know, like if you, have, if you do want to, you know, kind of make it in the outdoor industry and I have by no means made it, you know, I'm, I'm working a full-time job doing something else, but that is a goal of mine is to be able to do something you love all the time. I think that's what anybody's goal should be is, you know, be able to do something that you love all the time for your living. So, you know, for me, media, I feel like is a big part of it. You know, if I, if I do want to make it or be able to bass fish 24 seven, five days a week or seven days a week, whatever, you know, you do have to have some sort of a media presence. And so a lot of that's driven by that. Also a lot of it's driven, uh, driven just by wanting to capture your experience and share it with others. So it's a mix, you know, um, but yeah, I, I definitely like both aspects. I like I like actually doing it, and I like the media too. I think it's really fun. Plus, you meet a lot of cool people, you know, along the way and yeah. connection wise. And then yeah, I mean, the the fun thing I've learned uh, among the, I guess the many things now that we kind of engage in is uh, it's unlocked a lot of things as travelers. So as soon as I can speak like a certain language, just a, just a, a broken amount of of your language to talk about enough to be able to figure out how to go out duck hunting, all of a sudden we can have the same conversation. Yep. Um, the part where I think it gets really tricky for people is when they get way too deep into just one thing and they make one thing their entire identity. And I really like the idea that everybody can be, you know, just be you, be into the, the mix of things that you're into. Um, it happens a lot in the jujitsu world. A lot of people get really, really deep into like, that's their whole thing. Um, where I think it's really helpful to have a balance of a, another thing that you get into as well. You have multiple communities kind of, you, you don't have to make one thing your identity. You can just yeah. be the enigma, you know, um, be Renaissance man, I guess, you yeah, know what I mean? Know. Be into whatever shit you're into. Um, but it is good to like, to engage with other people. And, and I think there is, I think that's where true, like positivity does tend to happen online, frankly, is when you share a common interest with other people. Um, the problem I think is when people don't, don't either have interests or, um, you know, are just are talking to people who don't understand the thing that they're into. Um, and that would, that would never have been the case in any other time in history. You would be interacting with the people who did the thing you did, which meant you had something in common. Um, and that's the thing you can talk about. Um, like you shouldn't, you shouldn't actually be able to make conversation with everybody in the entire world. It doesn't make any sense. Like, yeah. you know, we should have conversations with people who we have something in common with. And sometimes it can be interesting to have a conversation with somebody nothing in common with, but the point is to find the things that you do have in common sort of conceptually. So, um, what, what is my point here? My point is it's great to really like get into these things. And I think when you're on social media doing the kind of stuff that you're doing and, and producing media about the cool things that you get to do, 
it opens doors for other people to be a part of that community too. Um, that's what we're looking for. Yeah, you definitely connect with a lot of people, you know, yeah. especially if you do well. And so if you actually, you know, throw a whole lot of time and effort and energy and money and all that to it, and you, you get all wrapped up in it, you're obviously going to do well. And if you're doing well, you know, other people are seeing it and you're making it on somebody else's Instagram page or this and that, or other people are posting you or reposting or whatever. And then you bump into other people who share the same interest and then, hey, man, you want to go hop in right. the blind? And yeah, let's yeah. do it. And then, you know, you meet all sorts of sorts of cool people and there's a whole lot of people that i know follow me and they like my stuff all the time and you never get to meet them you know because you're never going to be able to meet everybody but <laughs> it does bring a lot of really really cool relationships yeah you no know, doubt in along the way like i remember when i was first duck hunting before i got like super far into it i was just with my brothers or like with one family friend and then the more you do it the more you bump into people and meet people online and there's you know good and bad to that you know especially sharing you know your scouting hours and your time and in, in your actual spots that you find there's good and bad to that because you bring in another person with you but then they also know where you went right so then they bring other people and then it can also kind of ruin the hunting experience if it's too blown up and that's another thing that social media is kind of doing nowadays you know there's a lot of people that blur background uh, backgrounds and all kinds of stuff like that and so it is one thing it's like spot burning now there's a whole lot of stuff that goes on with that and i actually do have hunting buddies that hate when i post stuff because they're like oh my goodness people are gonna go look for it you know sometimes yeah. um but you know that's part of the game you know it is what it is you know you gotta think on tv there's always people putting stuff up on public land elk hunting and wherever or mm -hmm. there's the the like flw used to do a thing where they would have it's called like a day five so they'd have like four days of rigorous tournament fishing and then on the day five they go film them and they'd literally have waypoints pretty much on the screen of all his spots. So right. like over time, that stuff's it, it. It's just part of the game, you know. That stuff gets known, you know. And obviously, if you're a sponsor or if you're a, you know, mainly companies. If you're a company and and you're sponsoring a guy to go out and do, you know, bass fishing or or duck hunting or whatever, you want people to buy your product, and people aren't going to buy your product if it's not going to make them successful. So, is it gonna? You know, if you're not really telling people about it or telling people about the product, you know, if let's say it's an on the low, you know, duck load and it's some special new thing like a tungsten duck load and it shoots ducks up to 50, 60 yards and it's a huge game changer. It might be a really special thing to have in your arsenal. But if you're sponsored by a duck load company, they're going to want you to tell everybody about it. Right. It might not be the best thing for you, but that's just how the game goes, you know, um, and that's how people make money at it and whatever. And so, like, if you're a bass fisherman, it could be, you know dropping dropping the uh, the actual waypoints and winning the tournament is going to actually boost you know because you now you got a camera on the back of your boat filming the back of your jersey with everybody's you know sponsor name on it and you're making them all money and that's just kind of how it's going to boost you and whatever and it's the same goes you know with duck hunting or deer hunting or whatever it's all the same so there's good and bad to it but it takes but at the end of the day the truth is no matter how any of that turns out it's still going to take a massive amount of tenacity and discipline to be able to become a regular hunter or um, fisher in those spots. So the truth is, you, you know, still it's, gotta go do it. Yeah, it, you know, we might have made a piece of it easier, but the rest of it's still hard. Yeah. But it is a complicated thing. And it's the same thing when uh, I think of people hiking. When we used to do a lot of hiking out in Colorado, I was like, half of me loves that people are getting outside because I think that could change the world um, if people remember to go outside. And then the other half of me goes like, but not on my trail. You know what I yeah. mean? Because <laughs> I want to come out and have some peace and quiet. Yeah. Um, there isn't, well, there's too many of us. It's, I think, the real problem. <laughs> and that's know? kind of the part that makes it beautiful, too. Where, yeah. Like a really genuine experience is being able to experience it on your, not necessarily always alone, but being able to savor the really important parts, you know, and just really be immersed in the moment it's kind of ruined if you're sitting there staring at the big beautiful mountain and you got oh excuse me on your left you know every time Dude, you're walking down the trail it's, yeah yeah we've seen some stuff i mean when we went to um at grand tetons we went recently and it was just a nightmare it was like you don't ha you can't count to five on that trail without having to pass somebody or somebody passing you it is it's not like nature in the way that i'm used to nature yeah. it's made me far more a fan of I'm way more a fan of small county parks and small state parks and little wilderness areas because you you don't necessarily get that picture perfect national park national monument kind of thing, but like man, you get to go be alone. You get the real nature. Yeah, yeah. The whole point of the nature, which was to be alone, to experience it on your own, and to be responsible for yourself. Like 
uh, whatever happens out here happens out here. And like, you need to deal with that yourself. Yep. Um, that's the challenge of it where it's so like manicured and it's like you're at a theme park when you go to some of these busier places where you're not really, it, I don't know. I don't know if that, if like the presence of danger is like an important thing. It's one of the things I think, oh, for sure. But it, at the very least, just the feeling of isolation is, is like really important. Um, but who knows what to do with that, man? I mean, I don't think anyone has the perfect answer no. in terms of do I do I share this because that that will make hunting a bigger thing, or do I not share this because this is my spot and I need to be successful too? Everybody just has to grapple with that on their own. There, it's it's a it's a case by case thing, you know. There's a whole lot of people that are really really have really really strong feelings about it one way. There's other people that feel the other. I have a mix. There's certain places I try not to take people to, or I, you know, if you do take people to, you're like, Hey, look, man, if I'm taking you here, don't go back without me. You right. Know, kind of a thing. Like you talk to me since I put you on it, you know, give me right. You know, don't cross me up on it. So there's that. And then there's also people that they've hunted with the same people since they're freaking 10 and they don't hunt outside that group and they keep it really, really small. There's yeah. people like that. There's people that fish like that. There's people that'll only post pictures blurred. There's other people that will intentionally blow the spot up because it's going to get more views. You know, it goes both ways. Um, You know, me, I've done both. You know, I'm not going to be like, oh, yeah, I don't help people out because there's times where I drop the heck out of spots, you know, but half the time it's stuff I found, you know, and I've done a lot of it on my own, so I don't feel guilty like, you know, oh, my goodness, I'm crossing somebody up here. Like, a lot of it's been learned on my own. A lot of it's been done, you know, completely by myself. So, you know, if I want to tell somebody at a spot, it's not like I'm crossing my best friend. It's... I worked for it. It's my loss anyway. So, you know, sometimes that, that is, I feel like the whole clout thing is such a big thing now. And I, a while back I had a whole bunch of TikTok, TikTok followers. And the more I was like in that, it's like almost like you'll do anything just to, to kind of blow up. And then the more I've kind of grown up and after I had a girlfriend and stuff, it seems so weird, but it kind of brought me down to earth a little bit. And I was just like, you know, this guy's kind of dumb, like, you know, and it's not really as special and stuff. So I, I, I've kind of faded away from that. And I've, gotten back to like when i was a little kid man i would just i was out there because i loved it you know and then like media stuff came around and then it's like oh i can it's another thing you can chase you know if you got a hard drive it's like oh i want to be the best i want to be the best you know no matter what you're doing you want to do intense on everything and so like that came out i was like oh my goodness i want to achieve 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 and then you know after it's gone it's just like i mean there's no real substance to it anyways you know it's gone or it's it's there one day it's gone the next you know it's not like a, a real thing what you really remember is being out there in the field, you know, in all those hard hours that you've put, you know, in and stuff like that. And so that's kind of what I've brought myself back around to and just being out there and enjoying it a little more. I still do a lot of media stuff, but not as crazy. It's just for yourself, you know, yeah. and if, as long as it's for yourself, you're good to go. The, yeah. I, I have always felt good in a similar way about this podcast because I set the entire goal of this podcast to be that I could meet people that I wanted to meet all over the country and have an excuse to meet really cool people. Um, and all of those people that I've that I've had on the show, I've made like real connections with. Like this, like after having done this for I don't know um, a year and a half, maybe I, I can't exactly say how long the podcast has been on. Um, there, there, I'm hard pressed to find like a city I can't go couch surf in if I wanted to. You know what I mean? Or an event I could go tag along to. Um, it's it's really a, a unique thing. And so, like again, I'm cr- I was always creating this just for me. If people want to listen, that's great. And if that gives me opportunities to do other things, to meet cooler people and to do more with it, fine. But like at the end of the day, you are episode number, I want to say you're going to be number 71 or something like that. Um, and there's a few repeats in there, but that's over 60 people that I've now met all over the country. And not just 60 random people. It's 60 people that I sort of picked off the internet and was like, all right, we're going to be friends, you and me. <laughs> like, you know, That's super cool. It, that's a powerful thing, right? to just be like, I'm going to, I'm going to pick my own friends now because that's what I can do. That's what, that's what the internet has let me do. Um, as long as you're doing it for yourself, there is nothing, nothing wrong with that, you know? Um, and if it offers, if it, uh, you know, offers you other opportunities, that's great. If you be, if you blow up in the outdoor world, I'll be so happy for you and you'll be like living your dream 24 <laughs> seven, just doing whatever you want to do. But you're going to have to also have some of the other consequences of that. And, uh, more attention means more pressure and, yeah. you know, you can't always be honest anymore. As soon as you have a sponsor in a certain place, you can't be honest about yeah. that experience. And, yep. you know, you, you trade parts of yourself, you know. So we that all got to find a place. That's one thing I've always, I always kind of brought up around like a church setting when I was younger. And so like for me, there was a lot of, like my parents did a really good job, you know, kind of 
that's almost like bragging. You say, like, holy, I turned out great, you know, but like <laughs> they, they, uh, you know, they really did steer me in the right path and they had me kind of chasing the right things when I was younger yeah. um, and trying to, you know, help me make good decisions and stuff like that. And so one thing I've always was always like, my thing is like, I hate lying, which is so hard if you're like a outdoorsman guy and you're trying to keep your spot on the low, like, how do you tell the truth, but not yeah. blow your own stuff up, you know? So like I naturally, I just like to tell the truth. You know, I'd rather not sit there and, and BS somebody to their face just because like, it doesn't feel, it doesn't sit right with you. You know, like right. I've, I'm not saying I haven't lied. That'd be incredibly hypocritical, but you know, there's, if I got the choice, you know, I, I like to just tell the truth just because I feel like that's the genuine thing at the end of the day. And I mean, to me, that's a whole lot more like respectable and something that I actually like to do versus just like, you know, BS, BS and people. So that's just one thing I've always kind of done, but it's really difficult, you know, the bigger you get and stuff like that to, to be the honest, you know, sort of upfront dude. And then, you know, have a whole bunch of duck spots people are trying to chase down yeah. or whatever. It's, like, <laughs> it's really hard to play, you know, both sides yeah. of that. Yeah. And the more of yourself you put out there, it's, it's a strange thing. And the more people, the more people know about you and, uh, you know, again, like I'm, I'm really into self-defense. And so the idea of not being like a hundred percent private with my whole life is challenging for me too. Um, because people know a lot about me and, and I'll meet people traveling around doing jujitsu who like know things about me that I've forgotten that I had shared on, on podcast episodes or in our vlog or anything like that. And I'm like, Oh, right. Yeah, no, that, you know, that, you know, that about me, you know, trivia about me, which is a very odd feeling. Um, when normally I just want to be able to like disappear when I want to. And, I think that is a part of um, uh, of like that large scale attention that I don't want. Like um, Andrea's documentary, I, I sent it over to you that she produced, uh, got a lot of hits on YouTube, which we were obviously thrilled about. But now I feel strange when I'm traveling around to RV parks, knowing that like RV people are who watch that documentary and they know a lot about me. And so I, I can't necessarily walk around incognito around an RV park. There's a there's a statistical chance that someone in that park knows who yeah. I am. That's that's a weird feeling. It's yeah, it's a much different feeling. Yeah. Especially, Being anonymous is really nice, man. And yeah. I'm I'm glad to be like a small like I I'm by no means famous. It's really really nice. I think uh and it's funny the more we produce the more it's like the whole goal is to you know grow or whatever. I'm like I don't know. I don't know if that's the goal. <laughs> it's tough it. because like six, you know, success on some ends of that is really good but at the same you know sort of time success can in that sort of an area can actually draw a lot of the, the beauty out of it, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's difficult. You know, I remember there was times when I used to go fish the pass or I'd go fish, you know, wherever. And it was completely normal for me to be out there completely unbothered the whole time. And then like, if I go out to places like that, you know, now and people see me, it's like, Ben, what's up? And you're right. like, wait a minute, I don't even know this guy. And he knows my name. Like, that's a really weird feeling just to walk in somewhere and have somebody know well, your name. Think before. about it, like, you never even met the person or seen them. It's never a place you, you or I will ever be because it takes like the top 0.01% of the world, but you've got people like, did you watch The Last Dance on Netflix? The Michael Jordan uh, documentary? Surprisingly, I don't watch like any TV. Oh, really? No, not surprising again <laughs> at all. But this one's like kind of worth watching. He was a phenomenal guy. And like the strange thing was watching like, this guy can't have any semblance of a normal life. He can't go to the grocery store and pick up some milk. Like there's absolutely no way. It will take him four hours to sign all the autographs and there will be a huge you know, blitz of people to the store if he just tries to go buy some milk. Yeah. I, I, that is a different form of existence. That is you a know? very different form of existence. <laughs> that is, uh, that's, that's a lot and there's levels of that and there's people who within their own communities you know, can travel around around the nice thing is it like again if you're engaging with a community that you really like and that is full of people that you generally get along with like i think there a lot of hunters out there are some of the most reasonable cool people they are often safety conscious they're they're aware of themselves they're in charge of themselves they get a lot of nature time i feel fairly comfortable in an environment with hunters um so i've picked a good environment but if you uh, speak to a larger audience and you're just like i talk to gamers that's who I talk to. You're talking about a lot of different people with a lot of, a lot of stories of going on, a lot of walks of life. Um, so to, to become large in your, your micro environments where you get along with the folks, that, that is the dream, I think. You yeah. know? <laughs> I would definitely say so too. Yeah. 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 It's going to be a better experience like all around doing it like that, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I can't say, but, but the... the the aspect of like broad attention is a really that is a thing. very uh, yeah I definitely would never want that's that's a whole different ball game yeah it's one thing to walk into 
a room full of people that you respect and look up to and stuff like that and them have the same respect and look up to you the same sort of way. That's one thing versus right. walking into a grocery store with just everybody. Yeah. Every, like, you know, between a freaking homeless man and a mom with three kids and whatever, everybody knowing you, that's a very daunting feeling. I don't know if I would ever want that in my own No. Life. That's like you would never have any privacy either. No. Let's that's, both not do that. Sound yeah. good. I mean, we were going to. Um, so I'm glad we agreed not yeah. to. Not to like be. Like we have the choice. Michael Jordan famous. All right. Yeah, you yeah. heard it here first, folks. Uh, we will not be pursuing We'll make that a pact. Collectively. Hey, uh, Andrea, can you snap a few pictures for me? You mind taking a break? Poor Andrea. Still coughing. We caught you just a little bit. No, just a little bit. Sorry that you still have that cold. It's my fault. It's my fault. I'm so sorry. Um, all right. Well, before we wrap things up, did we talk about pretty much everything? Is there something else we were supposed to talk about? Yeah. Kind of told the story. Got, yeah, pretty much the whole story. Getting there at what, like, <laughs> oh, you guys had a, I drove the night before, slept in the car there. That's a good you idea. You guys drove in the morning. Yeah, we took off. We woke up around 3.15 or something yep. like that. We just pulled everything off the vehicle, pulled everything out of the back of the car, slept in the lake, got all out there, got everything all set up. It was we cool, man. Till about 10. We did the good old timer thing where it's like, okay, we'll give it 40 minutes. Then yeah. We hunted until 10, then bounce, and then. The FWC thing. I don't know if we talked. Did we talk about it? Yeah, we talked a little bit about it. A little bit about the FWC. We didn't go into who that worked out well for and who it didn't work out so well for, but, uh, you know, it worked out well for us. Yeah, it did, did work okay. out well for us. Um, you know, FWC, they obviously have a very valuable job enforcing, you know, game and stuff like that. And um, I do have a lot of respect for FWC, uh, but there are also points in time where I feel like they don't even get to do their job the way they want to do it because a lot of those people there are pressing people like that to, you know, an FWC officer or a cop or whoever to, to really like lay it on you because they don't, you know, that homeowner doesn't want you in there doing, you know, what you're doing. So they're going to do anything they can to kind of get you out of there. So yeah, if an FWC officer just bumps into you, you know, out on the water or in a natural setting, you know, it's typically really laid back and whatever. But then if, you know, an FWC officer had to respond to a call where, he's knocking on a door or he pulls up in the cop car and the first thing he sees, Oh my goodness, get these people out of here. Right. This, that, that. Then he's much, it's, it's a much different setting for him. So I'm sure for, you know, an FWC officer or what in that setting, you know, they're, when they get there, they're really, they have to go through all your stuff. Very, very, you know, fine tooth comb kind of way and really, really go through everything. So you, like you said, you know, you got to really have all your stuff together. So in that sort of a setting, they'll hit you on stuff that normally they wouldn't, you know, like right. I think the other, the canoe they had the the life jacket thing yeah and then the one had a busted plug in the shotgun so they could you could put one too many shell in there which isn't like a it it wasn't a a, you know intentional sort of a a thing but that's just something that happens you know people make mistakes and it's not you know somebody's intentionally trying to you know pull a gimmick or whatever but you know so that's kind of how it worked out for them they got whacked for a life (laughs) jacket and a a plug yeah one too many shells that's too bad but that's too That's bad, crazy, but so. it's all right, you know. He was we'll cool. Lived he was another really cool day. About it though, yeah. Yeah. Um, we. Uh, what was the other thing I was gonna? Oh, I totally lost my train of thought. Podcast listeners, it's been a serious week because you'll notice like how long it takes for this episode to come out because of how many we've had back to back. That like my podcast brain is about it's about done, right. and I have another one like this weekend, I think. So like, oh man, oh yeah, oh yeah, it's been something else. Um, it's exciting though. It's very exciting. It's a good life. I live a good life. It was very cool. Shit, I really had something else I was going to bring up for you. Pause. <laughs> I'll try to remember it. I'll try to remember it before we take off. There was something, it's important too. That's the worst part of it. Or maybe it's not. Huh? No, I don't think so. Oh, yes. It was just number one, let's do this again sometime, man. Next yeah. time we're down here, let's, let's do something. Uh, I'd love to. And if you're ever out where we are in the country, come by and we'll do something fun. Um, Sounds good. I want you to have your own show. I want most of my guests to have their own show, to be fair. But you, I really think, should have your own show. Um, so let's talk about that, too. And uh, tell people where they can find you uh, on the internet in case they'd like to follow along. Um, I think my Instagram's Ben underscore McCann underscore. I want to say my YouTube's Ben McCann, just flat out. I think that's just Ben McCann. I think my TikTok's like Ben McCann 76 or something like that, or it used to be. It's probably a little different now, Ben McCann something. Um, that's pretty much the three main things I use. I used to have a Facebook, but I don't really ever use that. And Snapchat's not my thing. It's I have 
very odd feelings on certain things, but Snapchat's <laughs> just one of those uh, gray areas. I don't use that, but yeah, that's pretty much my three main things. TikTok, All right. Instagram, YouTube. Cool. Find me there. We'll get or those here's my up. phone number. <laughs> no. Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> we'll get those linked up on the episodes. If you want to find those, you can just find them in the episode description. Um, we have got the video version on YouTube if you are still old school and just listening to this. Actually, I think it's generally pretty good to listen to, but the fun thing to watch will be Wild Hickson's On the Hunt. I think it's going to be like the third feature we do will be this duck hunt, so you guys can all watch along and enjoy that story. Um, Andrea is cranking away at the first episode, and then we've got two kind of mini ones, including this one coming out. So follow along. Uh, that's all you know at Wild Hickson's on YouTube. Uh, I am, as always, at T Hickson Life. If you want to see some photos from the hunt, we took a few nice ones, and you and I stood in front of the ducks as if we had done all that work, just the two of us, which was really nice. Um, so go check it out, people. Thank you so much to Ben for taking us hunting and just for all the good times, man. It's really good to meet you and to hang out. Let's definitely do it again. And thanks to everybody for listening. As always, we will see you on the next episode. Mm-hmm.